online with Ammer the Internet Guy. Stream it today on your favorite podcast platforms. This podcast focuses on entrepreneurs and business owners, helping them become more successful in conducting their business on the web without being stuck with technology, getting a headache, pulling their hairs out, or buying expensive software. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 21 of Online. First of all, I would like to apologize for taking so long with this episode. It's been almost a month since the last one, and I'm supposed to be doing one every two weeks. So I really apologize for the two extra weeks of delay. It has been very crazy around here uh, with work and many other things in the business. And I wanted to have the time to do a proper video editing so that this episode is awesome for you uh, hopefully that won't happen again <laughs> and um, I'm getting a little bit more help with my business now so I have more time to do my podcast and focus on marketing which is exactly what we are going to be talking about today if you remember in episode 20 with Eric Dingler we were discussing marketing in general and I told you that part two is going to be digital marketing or online marketing. So here is your online marketing special. Today we're going to go over SEO. Uh, we're going to go over website optimization and website speed optimization and why Google is tying your SEO ranking with uh, the speed of loading or the page loading speed of your website and what you can do in order to make your website go faster. Uh, the system of this episode has been flipped, so I'm not the interviewer anymore. Uh, Eric is going to be the interviewer, and I'm going to be the one answering the questions. So let's get in with this digital marketing special. Hey guys, welcome to part two of marketing today, and we're gonna be focusing on the online part of marketing. And we're going to, this is going to be a little bit technical, but we try to make it as easy as possible for the non-techies out there. Um, but we're mostly going to be looking at things like SEO, website optimization, um, speed optimization, maybe even uh, talk a little bit about um, ads and stuff like that. So anything that has to do with marketing online and specifically anything that has to do with your website. And for this specific part, uh, well, I want Mr. Eric Dingler to be the interviewer and I'll, I'll be answering questions and I'll get them all wrong. There you go. There you go. And I won't know just so, just to be clear, I, I, I won't know that your answers are wrong. I'll just go, Oh wow. I didn't know that. <laughs> so yeah, let me just get GT metrics on since you mentioned it. I just want to be looking at a page or a test on GT metrics. So, okay. Well, let me, let me start out with this for those that don't know what is somebody might be listening. Just heard. Like, yeah. What, what the hell is GT metrics? So let, yeah. let's not, okay. Forget, forget that I mentioned it. Now we'll come back to it later. Okay. Let's, because I think we, maybe, we need to reverse. Yeah. Yeah. I think maybe we should assume that people are listening and they know nothing. Yeah. About that specific, like the, the yeah. technical part of it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Okay, cool. So, well, let me let me ask you this, just to add it out of the gate, starting out with, you know, you hear an awful lot of people when it when talking about their website and as it comes to SEO and and uh, you know pleasing the the Mister Mrs Doctor Google, Doctor um, Doctor Google, yes. So let me ask you from your on your opinion um, when we go to attack online marketing mm. from the perspective of the website um, and optimizing the website and all that. What is the, what, what's our end goal? Let's start with the end in mind and then we can talk about getting there. So what's kind of your end goal with website? So every business owner, including myself, wants more clients. That, that's, that's the reality. So the end goal is that you want more clients. Um, the part that we are different in thinking about is how to get those clients. And in, in our previous episode or part one of this conversation, when we mentioned marketing, 
there was something you said that clicked with me and I hope that people are going to take notice. So I'm going to repeat it again is who's your ideal client? Because people, when they go online, they suddenly want to market to the whole world. They want to market to this globe. And this means unless you're willing to spend millions, it's not going to work. So first you need to decide who are you marketing to? Who are you sending your messages to? Who do you want to come to your website? As simple as that, think about it. So, and it's sometimes it's hard. Let me tell you, like for us, uh, web designers, we can build a website for everybody, right? So it's not necessarily lawyers or, or carpenters or doctors or dentists or whatever. There's, the sky's the limit. Flooring companies. Uh, <laughs> right. So who do except, I target? It's like, except it becomes there is, very hard. Well, there is one criteria I've learned um, because I was, I was, I, I used to think the exact same thing, but honestly, for me now, I, I'm not going to build a website for somebody that's not going to pay for it. Yeah. So that, yeah. So exclude this from your ideal. <laughs> right. Exactly. Like you need to be willing to spend, you know, at minimum $3,000 to start working with us. You got a proper website. It's not to yeah. start working with you. It's to have a proper website. Yeah. Yeah. And, to get, to get, to do it right, to yeah. invest in your business. That's just what we have found it, it takes at the minimum. So, so since we're discussing websites, let's, let's dissect it and put it out in the open. Okay, guys, there's so much, you know, uh, hype about things that go on a website or things that are related to the website. But there's also so much that goes behind the scenes that people don't know about. The reason for this is that you have platform-based page builders. And I'm an old school. I've been building websites from... 2000 or even 1999 and well, let's go with 1999 it just sounds yeah older, older. Yeah. yeah 1999 from the last century I'm from the 1900s <laughs> you you were building websites in the 1900s, in the 1900s yes and it started with html coding i mean at the time there was javascript there was html and i think css wasn't even there i can't remember when i heard the word css for the first time it must have been 2001 or 2002, I can't really remember. But anyway, what happened back then, Microsoft had its own office, you know, Microsoft Office suite with Word and Excel and PowerPoint and whatever. And at some point, they've decided they want to include a web builder. So they had something called front page. Oh man, this was dooms for our industry because now Every Joe, Dick, and Harry can build a website using front page. And it was as easy as actually typing in Microsoft Word document. The problem is none of them studied anything about web or web design or hosting or where the website will live or how to fix it when it breaks or how not to make your image so heavy so that it loads instead of you know the site itself not loading. And all the technicalities around building a website but people oversimplified it into a page that looks good and then over the years microsoft has actually removed this i don't know why they did but they, they were no longer doing front page it was no longer supported and i mean it wasn't bad if you're starting out if you just wanted like a, a an html page without having to learn html it was for you it was good because it's easy and the problem was that it had to add, like when you do a page or a site in, in front page, Microsoft front page would add its own coding in it. And at the time, Chrome wasn't the browser of choice or wasn't the strongest browser. Uh, Internet Explorer was mostly dominant. And then we had Netscape and they were kind mm -hmm. of like 50-50, but there were some, some browser wars. So the code that comes from Microsoft Netscape would not interpret it. Your site would look different. And you got to go back in time. We're talking about 2002, 2003. There's no mobile. So there's no smartphone at the time, right? So there was no responsive and no mobile. It was just websites had to be uh, browser compatible. And we had an edge, like when you knew what you're doing and how to build it right, you had an edge because whatever you build will work regardless of what screen size the user have 
and what browser or operating system. It would work on all websites, whereby the cheapy ones who would normally be using front page would not work, would only work with Internet Explorer. Fast forward to 2021 now, and we're in a similar situation with Wix, Squarespace, Weebly, all those like platform-based uh, page builders. They're exactly, they work exactly in the same way. You build things on it. They have their own coding. They have their own system of getting things done and you cannot move outside their system. Um, they're way better, of course, than front page, that they're easier to use, they're so versatile. So generally speaking, I'm not against them. I'm just about educating the people about what to expect. So, yeah. because for many entrepreneurs, they get there and they oversimplify it because they're only thinking about what meets the eye. It's a page that looks good. I can put my image well, here. I can build my page, it's a page there. Yeah. It's a page they think looks good. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, and I've, um, I've ran into a lot of clients with they that. They and their like, family. <laughs> yeah. Or their yeah, uh, close friends. I or, mean, have, you, have yeah, you ever I'll, had I'll, anyone tell you that your website looks like somebody close to you? Not, not in the industry. I'm not talking about us being web designers. I'm right. talking about the average business owner. Once they get their website, whether they did it themselves or they hired someone to do it, doesn't matter. If you go to your wife and ask her, hey, honey, I've got my website for my business launch. Well, she wants to support you. She's not going to tell you it looks bad. So everyone is going to tell you, yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> and not only that, they know your abilities. And for your abilities, they're going to go, wow, you That's did pretty that? good. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's really, well, that's really good. But since you've mentioned a number, you said, what did you say? $3,000, right? That's for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me tell people what's there because number one, nobody knows, like if the average business owner doesn't know much about domains and hosting, they don't know how to configure the hosting. So the hosting is where your site lives and the server, that server where your site is living has to be configured in a certain way in order for your site to perform properly, right? It could be slow, you could have problems, it could stop working. There's, there's so much that goes into that configuration. And I'm not, I'm not saying it takes a zillion hours, but it, it needs to be configured. Number two, which is very important, when you work with a business owner building their website, they're just gonna give you a folder full of images, right? These images are not optimized for web. These images, most of them are taken on a mobile phone or a digital camera, and their size is huge. It's humongous. If you just take the image as it is, put it on a website, it will simply load in about 30 seconds or more, which means no one will see anything. Like, it will still look great as per, your <laughs> as per the business owner's perception, right? but people won't be able to see that greatness because the site is too slow, they get bored, they go somewhere else. So the web developer or the web designer, the person you're working with, the professional you're working with will have to resize every image to optimize it for web so that the image loads fast and doesn't make your website slow. This is something that goes behind the scene. It's not something you see. What you see is the image on the website. What you didn't see is, What's the size of the image? How fast it loads? That you don't know about and you didn't see. Okay. Yeah. Furthermore, mobile phones, screen sizes are too small. Every Joe, Dick, and Harry would just put one image for every device, whatever the device is. And then what happens when the page is loading? And, and this, you see, this is my segue into the website optimization as well. When the page is loading, the browser size, so I, as a user, I'm, I'm a visitor to your website. So I go www.intransitstudios.com, okay? If I do it from my computer, PC, Mac, whatever, what happens, your web server, your website as well, how it's built is going to detect what is my browser, what's the version of my browser, what's my screen size? And it knows what it is and then it, it will have to serve me the images and the contents and the, the components of your website in a way that actually suits the screen and the browser that I'm using. 
Okay, right. that's also providing that the website is built responsive because the older, if your website has been built 10 years ago and you haven't changed it, change, chances are that you don't have this automatic resize. Now, if I access it from my mobile phone, my screen size is six, six inches, right? So it has to resize the images and every component on your page to my six inch screen. Now, guess what? In order for all this to happen, the detection and the resizing, it will take some time, right? It could be a couple of seconds. It could be a second. It could be less than a second, depending on how fast is your server and, and lots of other you know, um, things. But at the end of the day, you're actually telling the browser, hey, you see the picture as is, and you resize it to give it to the user in a size that fits their screen. Now, a professional web guy or girl would know that, and they would have two separate images. I mean, it looks the same, it's the same image, but two separate sizes of the same image. One for PCs or one for screen sizes that are higher than six inch and go all the way up, and one for six inches or lower. So this way, we're removing one step from the process to make it faster. So we're saving some time by loading mobile images into our site already mobile optimized. We're not going to rely on the browser to do that thing for us. So this is another thing that happens behind the scene. Now, dealing with themes and plugins and, and, and stuff like that, right? So what's the best theme? And why do we think is the best theme, right? There's no, to be honest, there's no best or worst. Right. It always depends on what the goals are, what we're doing, and how easy we want it to be for the business owner when they take the keys to their new website to be able to manage their, excuse me, their content. And optimizing plugins. Some people, for every little thing, they go and load a, a new plugin. And of course, the more plugins you have, the more code that these plugins will add to your website, the slower it will be because you're giving it so much more code to deal with. So every time I want to go to your page, it has to load all the components, including that code. So this is the thing. So that's the difference between a $3,000 website and a $500 website and a $10,000 website. It depends what's the structure. And I always tell people, my analogy is like this. Building a website is like building a house. First, you got to deal with the foundation, this being your hosting. Second thing, you got to deal with your framework, this being WordPress or whatever technology you want to use, if you want to use Wix or Squarespace or, or whatever you want to use. So that's your framework. And then at the end is your interior decoration. So foundation first, framework, decoration. Now with the framework, for example, we say WordPress is our framework. Anything that works with WordPress is part of the framework. So your theme, your plugins, how they work, your code, your JavaScript, your CSS code, all this is part of your framework. And then at the end, you have text and images and colors and font sizes and fonts and different fonts and, and the, the, you know, the, the full Monty. <laughs> and that's the idea. So a $3,000 website and a $10,000 website and, and, you know, um, I'm not going to put a number or a, or a label, but like a website that's done by a professional who knows what they're doing. They're dealing with all the three parts of it. They're dealing with your foundation. They're dealing with your framework. They're dealing with your interior decoration. The $500 website is interior decoration only, and your house will be leaking underneath and you won't see it. Yeah. No, I, so, I completely agree. That's, that's yeah, the idea. And how I, how I say, explain it to people is, <clears throat> um, so sometimes a uh, cookie cutter is, is all you need. You know, for my kids' birthday parties, we just need a cookie cutter. Because all we need is some co simple cookies yeah. for our wedding. My wife wasn't about to settle for something that came from a cookie cutter. You know, she wanted the cake. She wanted a baker. Like, you know, sometimes you need the baker. Sometimes you need a cookie cutter and grandma's, you know, recipe. Exactly. And that that's okay. Cause I'll, I'll say this, we don't publicize this on our website, but we do have a product we call websites made simple. Um, and it, it starts at $500, goes up to 2000, but you pick a template. Yeah. We, we, have, we have over 200 templates. You pick a template 
we will change the words, the pictures, and the colors. But that's it. If there are three blurbs, you know, three you're boxes. You're going to have the three blurbs. Yeah. You, you have you're to you're have three boxes, that. right? Yeah. You can't say, well, yeah. can I get a fourth? No, that's a custom website. Can I get two? No, this is a cookie yeah. cutter. Now, we don't publicize that. What we do is if somebody comes to us, we'll price them a custom website because we feel that's going to be what's best for you. Because not only are we doing all those things you've mentioned, we're also helping you craft the words. 90% of the time when somebody comes to us that with a, to redesign their website, they have way too many words on their website. Yeah. Nobody's reading that much junk. Like, and nobody cares about how old your business is and when it was founded and about Guilty as your, charged. yeah, nobody cares about your dog. <laughs> I did that. Yeah. What you, you know, what people care about themselves and they're looking for, you know, like nobody has gone to the hardware store to buy a drill because they needed a drill. Yeah. They, they needed the they, hole in the wall. Exactly. They, they needed a <laughs> hole. They're buying a hole that that Not drill, drill. Will create. Exactly. So it's the same thing with, with websites. Nobody's coming to your website at first to learn your whole backstory. Now there's a place for that, but not on your homepage. So you need yeah. somebody that can come and say, for every one time you mention yourself on your homepage, you need to talk about your customer five times because they're looking for That's their- That's a good ratio. Yeah, they're yeah. looking for a solution to their problem they're not yeah. looking at you because you're great. You know, they want to know, can you solve their problem first? And so you need to express it. A lot of people use really clever, like they'll come up with some clever tagline and I'll, and I'll just tell them, I can't tell by the tagline what you're, you know, yeah. making lives yeah. better. Are okay, you a how? church? Well, yeah. yeah. Are you a church? Are you a chiropractor? <laughs> you, you could be, are you an investment person? Like, uh, okay. You I don't just give me an doing. idea, but I'm not going to say it on air. Uh, okay. So <laughs> you need to, you need somebody that yeah. come, can come alongside and help you craft the words and all the technical stuff because nobody's ever bought from a website because it looked good or loaded fast. The words mm. on the website sold them, but people have left your website because it looked bad or it loaded slow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you need, let's say that again, please. Go. Say that one more time. Okay, I'll try. Um, <laughs> nobody's ever bought, or I don't even remember. So You'll people have to go back buy, to okay, so people, people so, buy from your website because of the because words of the words. on it. Right. It's not because the website looked great yeah. or it loaded fast, but right. people who didn't buy from it or people who left your website is because it didn't load on time or it didn't look great. Or they, yeah, they owed it and they're like, these bad. people don't know yeah. what they're doing. I'm not even going to read their words. So it's, it's a, and I, I struggle with this because some people are like, you know, content is king and stuff like that, you know, and the design is second. And I'm like, I don't know. I think, why do we have to choose one? No, but the, the design, like, yeah, the design. Why can't they both be good? Exactly. The design makes the content shine. Like it's a, okay. It's almost every single project that I get the amount of text that the client gives me is too much to fit on a page. And sometimes when I read it, it does make sense because they're explaining what they do in a good way, but it just doesn't belong all in one page or on one page or on, or in one section or whatever. Like it, so I have to play around the, with a lot of mix and match and try different sorts of modules, do I put it in a blurb? Do I put it in a box? Do I frame it? Do I have a little bit of a background to make some text shine? Do, do, I, have an, do I add an image here, even if the client didn't have an image here or whatever? It, it's almost like, you know, like we always say, I'm not a copywriter, I'm not gonna touch your content. But that's a lie, I always touch your content. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna write it for you, but I'm going to kind of like, uh, but I'll coach you on it. Repurpose it. Yeah. To a way yeah, that absolutely. I think will work better for you. And, and be after launch also, you know, if you're on a maintenance plan and we still have this relationship and we're working together, we keep, we're going to keep making those tweaks. Right. Right. I'm just looking for an example here. I, I'm working with a client and they sent me something, their website. Oh, their website, they kept talking 3PL, 3PL, 3P. And I went, 
I have no idea what you're talking about. And it's third party logistics. Okay. Oh, well, God. that's what we got to say. Yeah. You know, yeah, how many times our... people use acronyms on their website. We, they, they talk about, yeah. Anyway, web designers do this too. Web designers and digital marketers. Sure. Yeah. I mean, we always assume that our client knows what SEO, SEO is. PPC. Exactly. And I know that everybody should know what SEO is, but you shouldn't assume that they know. Right? right. And it's not just the acronym like, OK, SEO is search engine optimization. What the hell is search engine optimization? If if I'm having a website for the first time or if I like COVID, for example, COVID has pushed many business owners online. Some of them are coming online for the first time. Some of them may not have had a website, may not have been on social media before, or may have been on social media only for personal reasons, but they've never done anything business related on social media. So if you hammer them with all those details and the Facebook pixel and whatever, they'll just, you lose them. Like they, they yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, it's, it's, and that, and a good, a good web designer will help you navigate all that. And then on top of all that, you've got, you know, privacy policy, you know, privacy laws, you've got yeah. the legality side, which is important, privacy important and, and accessibility. And here's and the thing, yes. I am, yeah. I'm a big proponent of accessibility, but most people think that um, everybody's first question is, well, do I have to make my website accessible? You know, I'm, my, I'm not going after clients that are, are blind. How do you know? Okay. Well, not only that, but accessibility goes beyond. And it's legal a, as well, right? There's, right? There are laws against. Yes. And he, but here's the thing. It's just a social justice issue. Like yeah. why, why, just because you may not have to make it accessible for someone, you're, you're saying they don't deserve access. Well, that's not right. Um, but it goes beyond, a lot of people think that, well, accessibility just means for people with, with disabilities. But what about people with slow internet? Yeah, That's an accessibility yeah. oh, issue. Oh God, yeah. What about people that want to access your content in public and the only way is audio and you're not providing a transcript or text? Well, they can't listen to your thing in the coffee shop or in a meeting when they should be paying attention or in school or whatever it might be. Like, you know, but accessibility goes way beyond of course. people that are, are blind. Well, your website should be built in a way that's accessible to to all people. And there's ways that web design- You just reminded me of something you. that people often neglect. Just having an alternative, like the alt attribute of an image, like describing what is the image. Because if I'm, yeah. if I'm using audio- Yeah, and, if you're using a screen reader. Yeah, so most people have like a really beautiful image that the first thing on their website, maybe as a banner or as a background of a section or whatever. But almost every good, nice looking website these days has a big image. First thing, like the first thing that you the see. Hero, that hero section. The yeah. hero section, yeah. yeah. I don't know who came up with this name, but it is the hero of the website. Yeah. <laughs> Someone who's lazy uh, <laughs> and genius. Okay, so if somebody's not actually in the past for different reasons, we could switch image loading off in our browser. Yeah, we have a we have a guest. <laughs> I think you saw the you tail have a guest. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, so in the past, uh, on slow internet connections, when when we didn't have broadband or when we didn't have fast broadband and fiber connections and whatever like these days, and we were on dial-ups, we would switch the image loading off so that we can actually read the text on the website and get the information that we want. Right. So everything mm -hmm. there had to be descriptive. So instead of the image, you would see the image description, which is what we call the alt or the alternative, the alt attribute. And for accessibility, that's exactly the same thing. If somebody's using a screen reader uh, to listen to the content of your website, even if you have no audio, their screen reader will turn the text into audio for them. And then it has to tell them about the images. So it will have to tell them there's a logo of company XYZ here. Uh, there's an image of, and it has to be descriptive to your business. Don't, don't <laughs> because sometimes uh, the default setting is woman holding a bell. It's like, okay, what is that? Like woman holding a bell, you know? But, but let's say, I don't know, you're selling, uh, I don't know, uh, 
Any, pizzas. Any, yeah, pizzas. Pizza. Yeah. So you could say um, margarita or woman holding a margarita pizza box from and then your restaurant name. Right? Absolutely. It's your website. Yep. You can describe try, everything yeah. on it. Most most people try to either make it just SEO or just descriptive for accessibility. The the magic is when you do the two together. Exactly. Is when it has to make sense to the human being, to Google bot, to yep. someone who's using a screen reader or you know, to accessibility in general. And that's another thing that happens when you use a professional web person, right? In most cases, if you if you go and do it yourself, I'm not going to say nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, you'd have never seen anything called the alt attribute. If you're a business owner building your own website and you didn't study or read about building websites. Here's the, and here's the thing I tell people, like, honestly, I'll just be flat out honest. I'm just always honest, transparent. Pretty much all of my clients, in fact, I would say all of my clients could learn how to do what I do as a web designer. Yes. With because with YouTube, I you can learn to do my job on YouTube. No yeah, question 15, about it. 15, 16 hours. Yeah. You know, you you can you can totally, totally do it. However, what you're not gonna get is the thousand plus websites my team and I have built, that that cumulative experience. All of the data, you know, we we send emails every week for clients and we see what works and what doesn't. We do SEO, you know, reports every week for clients and send report. We're seeing what's working, what's not. That is extremely valuable um, that you're not getting. And you're going to have to spend hours and hours and hours watching videos to get caught up. Do you have the time to invest learning and then turn around and do what we do. And just to do it once, because you're not going to switch and become a web designer yourself, are you? Yeah. Now, take take how many hours? And I'm and I'm talking, you know, first realistically, you know, a hundred hours. Yes. Um, and multiply your hourly rate. How much do you need to make per hour as a business owner to survive? And that's actually I've had somebody um, uh, very nice girl, Erin. Hey, Erin, uh, who has a great website, a great looking website that she did on Wix that she did herself. Right. But when I asked her, she laughed and she said about 120 hours. And I said, okay, are you sure? She said, oh, maybe a little bit more. And I said, okay. And what's your hourly rate? And she said, well, I don't have an hourly rate. I said, wrong. You do. Because yes. if you spend this time looking after your clients or communicating with them or networking or, or doing your accounting or, or, or having fun with your husband and your son and your dog, whatever, there is a cost involved here. So it's not free. And she said, okay, let's say 50. And I said, okay, do the math. 150 hours or 120 hours times 50. How much did your website cost you? And it's still on Wix. You can't move it. You can, but it's going to cost you to move it. And you're going to have to rebuild it again. And every single blog post that you have there on Wix will have to be done in a copy and paste because Wix doesn't allow you to export anything. And every image is going to have to be like, you know, it's right. not easy. You built your business on somebody else's network. It's like, um, it's like operating a business out of an Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, he, and here's my thing. And I, and I help clients try to see this, like $50 an hour, that's not a long-term survival plan. And if it needs to be your sole income, that's about $96,000 a year. All right, now let's take out 15, 20, 25% for taxes. Um, how about health insurance? How, like, honestly, as a business owner, you can't survive on $96,000 in total income for a year for the long haul if you're going to also support a family. $50 yeah. an hour is not, I mean, you need to be making at minimum, I think, depending on where you live in the United States and Canada, though I'm going to say you probably need to be making close to $150 an hour. So take, take your ideal salary, divide it by, you know, 52, divide it by 40, there you go. 
And that's if you want to work 40 hours every single week, yeah. which I and, personally don't. And do you want to spend a hundred hours of those hours? Yeah. Now you're learning talking. to build websites for something that you're going to do for your business yep. or yourself. So, so what's once? the opportunity cost? $15,000 or 3000. Like you got to do the math out that way for it, for it to make sense. And then the, the other thing is, I don't know how this works in Canada, but in the United States, if we have a client that comes on and we build them a website and let's say we quote them $5,000, I'm then able to tell them, Hey, I tell you what, if you spend $10,000 on this website and we take 5,000, like I quoted you five, if you spend 10,000 and you get a website that's that meets W3C standards for ADA compliant, you know, we, we help you become accessibly compliant on your website, including transcripts for video, you know, all of this, you know, stuff. If we do all these things and put the code in there, right. If your business meets certain criteria, you know, a million dollars a year, under 30 employees, things like that. Like we send them this thing. You can get a $5,000 tax credit if you submit this form with your taxes. So you've spent $10,000 but you're going to get 5,000 of that back on your taxes as a tax credit. You get a $10,000 website for $5,000. That's cool. Not a bad, not a bad goal. Now you're not going to get that if you don't use a professional. I feel like we've drifted away from it. Yeah, but it's, it's you see, but all these little things that we're talking about are actually components of a website. Yes. So let's bring it let's back do that. to, what do you want to talk about first? Optimization I, I as want to talk speed or optimization as an SEO? Uh, We've touched over the two. I think we can talk about both with this idea because this we're, we're this, I don't want I don't know how long you want your things to last year. But here's the thing. I, I let me ask you true false and then you can you can uh, go off on this because I think I know what your answer is going to be. Oh God, I'm gonna get it wrong. No, 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 I don't think so. <laughs> so would you say true or false? There are plenty of people out there that from a marketing perspective, try really hard to make SEO um, and optimization of a website sound very complex. So true. Ha- okay, true. Yeah, I, th- I thought so. <laughs> so in our experience, you know, if you put the foundation in for SEO, your website's going to do really good over three to six months. It takes, it takes time. Yeah. But what I don't know about and what I want to hear from you about is I believe I've been falling into a myth that optimization on a website is really hard and complex. And I'm learning from you that it's not as hard as it really is. Yeah. It's well, I mean, it's common sense. I don't know is if it's because I'm a techie, but or or something else, but um, let's just like go back a little bit. We, we, we've been discussing this today. Uh, what's the goal of a website? The ultimate goal is to have customers or clients. Uh, you want to be communicating with your ideal customers, and this is what we've been saying. Now, the next part is where would you find this ideal customer? And in part one of our conversation, you've given us so many ideas about how to communicate with your ideal customers in a unique and and in a good way uh, that actually will make them remember you or remember your communication. Now, if you take this and try to apply it online as well. So most people, they get over-invested in SEO. And I, I mm. personally, I would have to say, and that's just my opinion, I could be the worst person in the world that has this opinion, but SEO is way, way overrated. Let me say that again. SEO is overrated. Your life does not depend on Google. Your life does not depend on social media. Your business does not depend on SEO, like completely. It's not like if you do SEO bad, you'll have zero business. Um, One of the examples, like the, the latest episode that's already published of this podcast A very nice lady from New Jersey. She's a personal trainer. And when COVID hit, they had to close the place where she was training. She went online and she became very successful. And she has way more business than she ever had. She's way more successful. She's making double or triple what she used to make. And till date, she has no website. No, zero, 
no website, no social media, nothing. What I meant by going online was on Zoom. She started to train on Zoom and she's using her email to connect with people and SMS messages. So there's some use of technology there, but it's not SEO and pleasing Google and her business is doing fine. Okay, if she does the other stuff, if she does SEO, she may be able to grow even more. If that's the goal, if that's the target, maybe she needs more time to spend with the family. Maybe she's okay with the amount of business she has now. Maybe she wants to do the rest of it as a contingency, but it's not urgent. That's fine. It depends what your goal is. So thinking SEO only for your business or for your marketing is not the right way. <clears throat> the other thing is, Search engine optimization. Okay, why are we trying to please Dr. Google? Because it's the dominant search engine. It's the dominant everything. Well, Google owns YouTube. And, and this also makes your job a little easier because Google loves its own properties. So if you produce content and put it on YouTube, it helps your SEO, right? See, I didn't say anything about ads. I didn't say anything about keywords. Just produce content, produce authentic, real, good content that people will enjoy, real people will enjoy. Google will reward you. Work to please Google, you'll not get the reward because they'll change their algorithm. And when you've been ranking that high, you're going to get down low only because you're trying to work with the bot, not with the real person. Now, what else? What else does Google own? Google Maps. So if you get customers leaving you reviews on your location on Google Maps, which is called Google My Business now. Okay, Google loves that. And then your ranking will improve. If you write, and this is some people don't know about it, you can write blog posts on Google My Business. You can share your whatever blog posts you have on your website. You can share this on Google My Business you know, copy paste, whatever, and then have a link that goes back to the actual post on your website. And Google sees that you'll be rewarding. So it's not as complex and it's not as hard and you don't have to spend on advertising. Right. The next one is, should I go and hire somebody to spend? And, and if you remember, we've had this example already in, in, the, in the first segment or the first episode of our conversation. Should I spend $1,500 a month on SEO and paid ads? Well, it depends what's your cost of acquisition and what do you think is fair or reasonable? If you're going to do like the, the example of the lady that I told you about who was spending 1600 to get 300 in sales, by all means, don't do it. Right. Um, if you're trying to launder money, it's a, another thing. But, <laughs> but there Sorry. are times that I, yeah. I have a client, um, they're a, a large realtor. Uh, in three states last year, they did a billion dollars in service. They pay more than fifteen hundred dollars a month in of SEO, course. but they did a billion dollars in tra over a billion dollars in transactions. Yeah, so it's the cost of what acquisition and the life, yeah. the, the 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 life cycle of the customer, uh, right? With you, how long they will stay with you, and how long they'll stay as a customer, as a paying customer. If you have any upsells, if you have any upgrades, if you know, if your services change and you make new services and they subscribe to your new services and, and the whole lot. So it, it, it really, you have to do it first, starting with your goals. So don't start with your budget. Start with your goals. Don't say, hey, I want to spend $300 a month on SEO. Let me go and find somebody who's going to take this money and help me. It's not going yeah. to work. You're going to end yeah. up working with somebody 5,000 miles away who doesn't know anything about your business, who's yeah. going to take your money, buy some ads, and that's it. Call it a day. Yeah, if your goal is traffic next month, you're always going to be frustrated. Yeah. With SEO. It's you it's a long-term game. So you have to grow your SEO organically, but in the meantime, in the meantime, do not neglect the humans. So spend time to connect with people, spend time to speak with people, spend time to meet, network. Even if you're shy or an introvert or whatever, just like find a comfort zone, find a place in your local community where you feel comfortable. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're all going to get vaccinated and COVID is going to disappear or not be as, as, as scary as it is. And then it just becomes like a regular flu. 
<laughs> and we can all meet again and we still can be like reasonable like sit a little bit far away and whatever but anyway in my opinion time and money spent speaking with people real people is way better than time and money spent trying to beat seo there's always like beat your competition by just using seo and again unless you have a big budget and you're making so much money out of it so that it makes your cost of acquisition quite low because like look as you said somebody's making a billion dollars spending thirty thousand, not a big deal you know it's what percentage wise is very low right but somebody's spending ten thousand dollars to make five they're losing Somebody right. spending 10 to make 10, you're breaking even. You haven't done much. Right. You know, maybe, maybe, just maybe, if you're just breaking even, it's good because some the awareness is growing. So that, that's the only good thing about it. But if you're not making money out of, you know, and you have to have a good, clear way to measure, and I shouldn't be the one telling you how to, it should be the person you're hiring to do your SEO for you. So, and that's why I say, I don't do SEO. I do SEO coaching. I'll teach you. You yeah. do it. You take care of your business and your marketing because no one can speak about your business better than you, Mr. and Mrs. Business Owners. Right? Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. I completely 100% agree. And, and here's, here's, I think, the, the key to all of it. You have to understand Google's business model and what they want to accomplish. What Google wants to accomplish is getting eyes on ads. The more eyes they get on ads, the better. Well, how do they do that? Well, you got to take a step back and wrestle with the principle behind the practice. There are a lot of ways to get eyes on ads, but the, the way you get people to come and look at them over and over and over and over all on their own and not forcing them to do it is answering the questions they ask the first time they ask it. So if the reason people like using Google is because when you go and look how much does the average elephant weigh, you get the answer right away, right? So every time you ask a question, you get the answer. The next time you have a question, you're going to go back to that source. Google stops delivering the answers or somebody else starts delivering it better. Because I'll tell you something, I'm in some areas... We're, we've moved away from Google and we ask Alexa because yes, it's easy yes. to ask Alexa. I don't, I don't even have to type yeah. anymore. All right. So Google is all about answering questions and delivering content as long. I love yeah. that part. So when you deliver the answer to people's questions and Google sees that and sees that people like your content, that means people are likely to come back to Google. Google doesn't care if people come back to you. Google could care less if somebody came back to my website a second time. Google cares if people come back to Google a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth time. So when yes. I think of the humans behind the numbers and I deliver content for them and Google sees that, now Google goes, well, I want to show his answer. I want to show her answer again. In the past, it was all a technical right. thing and algorithms and bots. Why? Because Google were building this massive database. Yeah. Well, it was the best way Earth. we knew how to measure at the time. Yeah. But at the time, also, like when we started, you could soil <laughs> your web page with the keyword all yeah. over you, the place. That makes you just make it. You just make the font humans. the same color as your background. And so human eyes can't exactly. see it. Exactly. So human eyes can't see it, but down there at the bottom of your page is full of like web design, Virginia, web design, uh, uh, Baltimore, web design, DC, web, like everywhere, right? Or maybe it was just web design, Virginia repeated 100 times because that was the way it is. It, it, the algorithm used to just count yeah. how many times the keyword has appeared. Now, Google is moving it not is moving, has already yeah. moved. It's moved like maybe two years ago towards pleasing the human beings, not the bot. The bot doesn't need pleasing anymore. The database has been built already. All what they're doing, they're just updating it with the latest stuff. So if you're an expert in your industry and you have content that's very relevant, that people actually like, and Google can see and feel that you know people like your content, you will rank higher, 
even if you spent zero money on ads, right? So this takes us to the change that's coming. Yes. There's a change that's coming that Google are going to be implementing this May, this coming May. And this change is having a lot of people going round and round in circles. Yeah. And, and I think the majority of I think it's yeah, an, I think ahead. it's important and significant to say that this is the first time they've telegraphed a major change in the algorithm. Ahead, they did before, but people ignored them. Oh. But this time, when they've telegraphed ahead, they put it in a way as such: you'll be losing if you don't take action now. Because uh. before they used to tell you something like, "If you want to rank higher, do this." Well, I don't want to rank higher. I'm not going to do this. Now they're saying, if you don't do this, you lose. And he's like, no, I don't want to lose. So I think the wording was a little like, you know, and they didn't say, they didn't say exactly you lose, but they said like, it will negatively affect your ranking. And they, they even didn't say what type of ranking. Is it SEO ranking? Is it another ranking? Is it, you know, uh, best website in the world ranking? I don't know. They just said the word ranking. And, and the majority of people who are now stressed out are web developers and designers because their clients are now calling in and sending emails and saying, I don't want to lose, do something for me. <laughs> like I, I, you need to fix my website. So the, there are many changes that are happening. Basically Google wants to focus more and more on the user experience. Who is the user? The user is your website visitor. The person who's going to come to your website. So um, what they did in the past few years was things like, is your website secured with an SSL certificate? And then you get extra points for having an SSL. If you don't have an SSL, you don't get the extra points. Your ranking is a little bit lower. Then, so if you and your competitor are equal, you have an SSL, your competitor does it, you rank higher. So if both of you are pizza restaurants in the same locality, the one with the SSL wins at the time. And then take it a step further. If the both, both pizza restaurants in the same locality, they both have SSL, who wins? The one with more content, relevant content wins. Okay, now take it a step further. What's coming in May? They both have great content. Their content is liked by their clientele. They both have SSL. They both have a good responsive website that works well on mobile. They both have good colors. Uh, accessible. So like they're kind of equal. Who wins? The one that loads faster than the other. Yep. So that's, the <laughs> so they keep going one step further. And then if everything else is equal, who wins? Well, that's the next. So when we talk about the user experience, you could have the best website in the world with the best content in your industry. And people love the content that you have right? But your website takes 10 seconds to load. Hmm. For a new user who found you somehow, whether found you by Google or was referred by a friend or whatever, someone found your website somewhere. If they click and it doesn't load within like kind of three seconds, they're probably going to leave. Like it depends how invested they are. Like, you know, how strong the referral was. If they're coming from a friend, they, someone they trust and they like, they'll probably wait. But if they found you on Google or social media or just a referral that wasn't from a friend as in a friend, like somebody said, oh, why don't you go check this company, right? If your site will not load within the three seconds, they get bored and they leave. They just click away. If they found you using Google, they still have the page that has the results. They click on the next one, which is your competition. So that's what we're saying. That's the change. Now, our good colleagues, friends, co-petition, they're getting worried and they're over-obsessing yeah. with the scores, the tests. So there are so many tests that you can do to test your website and see how long it takes to load. They're virtually, there's like hundreds of them, right? If you're a non-techie, you'll use a test that just gives you the loading time in seconds. So you know that your website takes four seconds to load or five seconds to load. So you know now what you need to do. You need to you know, cut down the time to load from five or four seconds to three or below. If you can do it in two seconds, that's even better, right? And, and that's it. Like in my opinion, 
this is ABC speed optimization. Just make sure it loads within the time frame that is good for the human beings visiting your site. Yeah. Now, should I obsess because different tests there's google page speed there's web dev test there's gt metrics the, the the name that we mentioned in the very beginning today right and then these tools they give you a ranking a b c d f and it makes you look like oh my god i'm failing my college you know you get an f or you get a d and they take into consideration so many things it's not only your your web site loading time in seconds it's how much code is there? How much time does your code take to execute? Um, how many things are linked to your website? And people sometimes think, oh, I've got nothing linked to my website. Well, you don't know that. If you use Google fonts, your fonts are coming from Google. Your fonts are not on your website. They're actually on Google. And when a user comes to your website, there's a request that goes to Google to bring the fonts to the page so that they display correctly, right? You don't know that. If you have reviews on your website that come from Google Maps or Google My Business and you use a plugin to bring these reviews, the text and the stars of the reviews and the photo of the customer in the reviews come from Google. And get this, because I have this on my website. I just didn't have time to do it yet. The image that comes, you can't control the size of that image. Like, so I'm using a plugin that links to my Google My Business, brings all these reviews. I have zero control. I have control on the display size. So I can display it in a certain way within my website and it looks uniform with the design, but I can't actually decide the size of the image that comes mm. from there. And guess what? It comes as big and then the browser resize it, which is not optimized. Right. So what I want to do, I want to get rid of the plugin and I'll just copy them. The problem with this is that you get busy and you get new reviews and you have no time to copy the new ones. So you only have, so I mean, using the plugin is good because whenever a review hits Google, it appears on your website automatically. So it has its pros and cons. Yeah, yeah. but wouldn't a, wouldn't a potential workaround for that be to not have the, because what, what page is Google testing? Is it every Usually, page? They test all the pages, right? But usually right. we focus on the home page because right. this is when somebody sees your website on your business card, that's where they're going to go. Right. This is when so, you network or whatever. But Google being Google, of course, they see every page on your website and some other pages could be mega fast, brilliant. And you'll figure out if you've been in business for some time that you're probably ranking for keywords on inside pages, not on the home page. Right. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. So a workaround would be, why couldn't you create a reviews page, use that plugin on that page and then have a link to it. But then on the, the home page, yeah. on the home page, have some strategically copied ones there exactly. yeah. that don't need to change and then updated review. Cause the best place for reviews from a conversion standpoint is beside every call to action. So yes, because yes, if somebody yes. goes to waiver that call to action button, but then they see these five stars or these it four convinces points. them because yeah. people like your service. Right. So actually 4.7 would probably convert better than five, believe it or not. But you, you know, you have yeah. some stars there, a person, they, okay. Yeah. And they, they click it. Well, you don't need a plug in there showing every single one. Exactly. But that's my point. There are yeah. components that come from outside your website. Yeah. So no, that's good. The more you eliminate them, the higher your optimization ranking will be. You can't eliminate everything, okay? And then sometimes when you look at the the outcome of the test you're doing, like Google Page Speed, well, I just said a little while ago, Google they love their own technology and they love their own properties. Google owned the browser called Chrome. Chrome has specific type images that they love which is very modern, very new, is called WebP. So if you go and convert all the images on your website to WebP format, Google will love you more. You will rank higher on the Google page speed or the web dev test. But, and this is something I learned the hard way, WebP is not yet supported in full by the Safari browser. So if anyone is using Apple, 
<laughs> an iPhone or a, or a MacBook or whatever. Which is a lot. Yeah, which is a lot. Either one of two things will happen. So if you switch all your images to or convert them to WebP just to score higher in, in, your, in your page optimization, what's going to happen uh, for a, a user who comes in with a Safari browser, one of two things. Either they will see no images at all, which will make your website look bad, or your website will take longer to load for people with Safari because it's going to look for the alternative image, which is still as JPEG or GIF or another format uh, other than WebP. And most of the plugins you use to convert to WebP, they still keep, of course, the older version of the JPEG yeah. and, 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 and PNG or GIF or whatever it is that you're using. Um, to use when somebody comes in with a browser with a browser who doesn't support it, but this will take time because first the detection of the browser happened, then the detection of the size happened, then the detection that happens that says whether this browser can see and load WebP or not. Then you go and fetch the image and give it. So here you're going to be losing another, I don't know, a few seconds, right? So, or half so a second. The, so at the end of all of this, you may use a tool. And you may get a bunch of terms like, you know, render blocking or yeah. too many requests. Okay, let's, render blocking like is this. important. Let but, me talk but about this. But, but before yeah, before you ahead. talk about it, my, my question is, if you get all of those things and the GT metrics gives you an F, but your page load is 1.2 second. seconds. Yeah, yeah. Who cares? Exactly. Like the, the experience that you're delivering. Now, if you are, you where it may, I guess, come into play is it would be good to check your number one, number two, number three competitors. Yes, indeed. So um, this is exactly, you got it. Like I didn't have to say it. Okay. You got it. <laughs> you got it on your own. I was guessing. If, okay. If you're in a very extremely competitive niche or niche, if you're in the UK, I'm mixed. I can say niche and niche. Le niche sounds French. Uh, <laughs> the niche, Monsieur. I'm going to say it the right way and say niche. I'm not a Quebecois, I'm but I speak it's, French. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. It's not the right way. <laughs> so, if you're in a very competitive niche, let's say, for example, uh, travel or cuisine, or like I, I know uh, a very nice lady who who came as a guest on my podcast as well, and she's in a mega competitive niche, and this niche. It's cuisine and travel. Her, her site about, is about cuisine and travel. So it's about uh, real experience, not online experience, the actual real. <laughs> we, we all want to go somewhere now after COVID. Um, right. And um, she's overly obsessed with website optimization. But the reason for this is that her closest competitor is very close, really close. So she wants to get an edge. So if, if my competitor scores a B on the GT metrics, I want to be an A, you know? Uh, and the problem is in that niche, it's all based on images and videos. And the more images and videos you have, the harder it is to get it to load fast, you know, cause you got to optimize every image and every video. And then videos are hosted somewhere else. So you're bringing component that's external to your website. And if you put the video on your website, it's going to make it even slower. So it's kind of like it's a very delicate. So for her and only for her, it's okay and it's justified to spend 20 hours a week optimizing your website. Right. For the average business owner, you don't need all that. As long as your website loads in about two seconds, you're good. It doesn't really matter what your JT metrics is. It doesn't really matter what your Google page speed. I mean, I'm not saying don't see it or don't look at it. You look at it, there are things that you can do that are easy to do, like resizing your images for mobile. That's fine. You or your web person, contact your web person, tell them, hey, you know, I did a test on Google page speed and I found that my uh, mobile images are too big. Could you please make them smaller? Could you make them mobile optimized? That They'll happily do it for you. And then you'll score higher, your, your, your uh, optimization, or, or score will improve, right? But when it comes to things like eliminate render blocking, the average business owner would think like, what? 
Avoid chaining. What? Chaining? What is that? Okay. I can't tell you what's chaining because every time I read about it, I even I get confused. <laughs> what I understood is that, as we know, for every website, when you access a website as a user, this is called, in technical terms, is called a request. So you, you're requesting resources from a server. That's why the word URL means uniform resource locator. It's a uniform way to locate a resource somewhere online. And that's the address. So that's why we call it a URL. So when you do this, you're requesting the components of a page from a certain URL or domain name. Now, these components, as we were just saying, there are components that come external to your website, like your videos that are hosted on Vimeo or a video hosting platform, like your Google um, reviews that come from Google My Business, like Google Fonts, all these, they come from different websites and each website has a domain. So it could be fonts.googleappies.net or .com or whatever. And this is where your font is coming from. So now in your design, sometimes you are chaining this meaning you're telling the browser, this resource is there. The browser goes there only to find the redirection. Oh, I'm sorry. This resource is not here. Go there. The browser gets there. Oh, this resource has moved. It's there. And that's like a chain. It keeps on redirecting. And sometimes people even go a step further. It redirects to itself and it becomes an infinite loop. Loop. Yeah. And then this, this is so bad for everything, for your SEO and for your um, loading speed and whatever. So that, that's my understanding of the chaining part. It's more complicated than that. And I don't wanna break my head over it. Now the render blocking, we use WordPress now. WordPress in general, the, the reason number one for anyone to use WordPress, anyone, not, not just web designers, like business owners or website owners is because it has content management. So basically think of it this way. It's a software. WordPress is a software. It's not a website. We use it to build your website, but in reality, it is a software. The software was written and coded to give you easy content management. It wasn't coded to please Google. It wasn't coded not to have any JavaScript, zero JavaScript. On top of it, we use themes or templates, you know, to make things look beautiful. We use themes to make life easier, like DV theme because it has a front, um, a front page editor. So you can actually, what you see is what you get. You can, you can edit your website live on the page rather than do it from an, a back end without seeing what it looks like and without seeing your changes live. Now, in order to do this interactivity, there is JavaScript code. When you put things to make them beautiful and change their color and, and make sometimes uh, simple animation on the page as it loads or when you scroll down or when you hover your mouse over something and it changes color or it becomes bigger, smaller, whatever. All these animations are done using a script. It could be HTML5, it could be JavaScript, whatever. So when the page loads, all these scripts have to load first. And most of the time, the script goes in the header of your page. And I don't mean the header that you see, the hero section. I mean the header that you, you don't see. It's behind the see, scenes. Right. In, in the head. Uh, it's, it's the head tag. So most of the script goes in the head tag. The word render blocking means every single piece of script that's in your head tag has to load first into the browser of the user before the site renders, before the part that the user eyes see comes in. So all these scripts will be loading in the background first. Then the user will start to see the image and the colors and the text and the rest of it. So this is what it means by eliminate render blocking. Now, if you completely eliminate render blocking, your site look and feel will break because people will not see the animation. People will not see anything 
that had a script because the script didn't load. If you eliminate it, it means you just removed all your script from the header. Your website will be blazing fast, but it will look broken. And I've done that oh so many times <laughs> when playing with <laughs> all the um, optimization plugins and the caching plugins. And you set everything to automatic. You go to your website, you do your speed test, and it's 500 milliseconds, and it's wow. Then you go and look in your website, and it looks bad because everything that was supposed to load did not load. The fonts right. didn't load, your, your animation didn't load, nothing. So there's a balance here. There's a balance like we spoke about WebP. Do I do WebP and please Google and alienate everyone who's using Safari? Or do I keep it as a JPEG or PNG and deal with a little bit of a penalty from Mr. Google? It, but I'm not alienating 40% of my prospect customers who are using Safari. And if I wasn't told by a friend that my website wasn't loading in Safari, I wouldn't have believed it. I've optimized, I've done my homework. I'm good. I'm an A in GT metrics. My page has, I don't know, 80% in Google page speed. It loads in 500 milliseconds. Well, now my page loads for everyone in about maybe 2.53 seconds. I'm, I'm happier, even though if Google is unhappy, I think my, my score on Google page speed is really low. And, and some people even, you know, uh, they're not competition because we don't cooperate, they're competition and they're fast to, to, oh, the optimization guide doesn't have a good score. Well, I don't care right. <laughs> about the score because for the human, my website loads fast. No one is alienated. It's as accessible as possible. You know, I've done the homework for the human beings and I'm not over obsessing to actually please Mr. Google. And yeah, I mean, you could say maybe you're not in a competitive in niche. No, I am in a competitive niche, but what I've decided to do is to spend more of my time speaking with people and getting referrals and having real connection with real people. And if, because again, okay, I've been in business since 2016. That's what, like five years? I wasn't full-time on business until COVID hit um, last year. You know, so the web design was always, the web design business was always there, but I wasn't focused, fully focused on it till last year, right? Mm -hmm. And when I go and analyze, where do my customers come from? I've never had one single customer that came from a web search, zero. Although I have lots of traffic coming my way from Google search engine, but none of them actually converted. They didn't buy, they didn't become a customer. Those who became customers came through somebody who knows me, a past client, a friend, a, sometimes even a competitor or a, Co competition <laughs> and um, or a, a social media post that I put there or they read something or you know uh, but usually they didn't come just by googling web design Vancouver and come to me never happened okay so why should I care and then when I go and do the search myself web design Vancouver there are companies that have way more money than I do and they're paying so much in their advertising kudos to them that's fine but I don't want to go and compete on that front because it will, you know, break my bank. Small business, I'm a small business owner. So what I focus instead, I focus on the people that I serve. And I don't care much. That's, that's why I don't care much about the GT metrics and the Google page speed score. Um, now, just to sum up the render blocking part, because I only gave the example of removing everything and the site breaks. So what you should do, you shouldn't remove everything and you shouldn't leave them as they are either. So you use a plugin, a caching plugin, like I always tell people use Lightspeed because it's free. And also because many of the modern hosting companies now use a Lightspeed server. So a Lightspeed server with the Lightspeed plugin, in my opinion, is the cheapest and easiest way to go. There are other options, of course. There are, there are more expensive hosting, uh, you could use a content develop uh, a content delivery network CDN. You know, which is something else that you can use to make your website load faster. 
uh, th th there are many things, but the thing that's easier to use and cheaper and works with your current hosting would be to have a Lightspeed server on your hosting. It's a regular shared hosting, which is about, I don't know, 10, 15, like less than $20 a month for good hosting with Lightspeed server and SSD and, and good memory. Uh, and then you have the free Lightspeed plugin. Uh, I do have an actual uh, a free um, video that shows people how to configure it. Not in depth, but like the, the easier way to make it work. And then what it does when you're configuring it, when it comes to your code, your, your, uh, your cascading style sheet or CSS, as well as your JavaScript code, you're trying to combine and minify. There are some parts of this that you cannot combine and minify. So whenever you see the word or the term jQuery, please leave it alone. Don't touch it. Right. Don't minify, don't combine jQuery. And I think the newer version of the plugins now, they detect it and they leave it alone automatically, even if you just check that box. Okay. Uh, but some of the JavaScript that you have on the page can be combined and minify. Your plugin, if you configure it the right way, your plugin will handle this automatically. You don't have to do much. It's, it's like there's a, there's a tick box. And then there are a few things that you put as an exception. One of them was jQuery. Um, the same thing you do with CSS. And then you can test it. So, okay, if you're a web developer or a web designer, if you're one of our colleagues, hey, and if you're uh, on Josh's group, hey, again, <laughs> what you do is get a staging site, take a copy of your website, put it a sta staging on a subdomain or another domain, whatever you like. Play around, break the hell out of it. Put the plug in, switch all the tick boxes on and see what it looks like and then test it. If it scores better than your actual website, overwrite it. Like, you know, uh, push your staging into production. And, but play not on your uh, live site, please. Right. <laughs> I've done right. that. <laughs> I know what it's like when it breaks. <laughs> play around, do all your things. What these plugins basically do, they take the big bulk of all this code that's in your head tag, and they try to load it later. They delay it a little bit. So they get the page to render or parts of the page to render so that the human being who's looking at the page sees something instead of waiting for all this code to load. Then they load the code a little bit later in a delayed way. Some of this code can be even loaded in the footer. Things like what you captcha. You know, when you have a, a login form and you want to anti-spam it and you have a captcha plugin that gives people like a puzzle to solve or something, you don't need that to load in the header. This can be loaded after the page has loaded. Another thing, when you use a plugin to do a job like CAPTCHA, like anti-spam, CAPTCHA, CAPTCHA anti-spam, what the plugin usually does by default, they load this JavaScript part on every single page. You don't need that. You want it on your login page. You don't want it on your home page. There's no login there, right? But when you use a plugin, it's really hard to actually make sure that it doesn't put the code in your home page or on another page or whatever. And so there are plugins that actually clean up that code for you if you wanted to. So there are so many avenues, like we could talk about it for hours. You could spend 100 hours <laughs> optimizing your website. If you had the time, no one has this time, not us, not our clients. And, and this takes me back to the first point is step number one, load time in seconds, like target this first make the site load fast for human beings and only go to step number two if you need to and when you need to because it's going to cost you time and money no no that's good that's all really good stuff that's fantastic so i i think so i i you know people are freaking out over this not everybody you know a lot of people are really freaking out and then there's a lot of shysters out there that are trying to make this sound worse, sound like a bigger deal because they're trying to take your money to do something that, um, you know, you may need to spend a couple hundred dollars. There's there's no doubt about it um, because it does take Yeah, if you're not a techie time. and you don't like back, and even if you're a techie, even if you're a, a web designer, right? Do you really want to spend your time fiddling with DNS and PHP configuration and back end stuff right. and going to the Lightspeed server and ensuring how it works on your hosting? 
if you have the time, do it. If you don't, find someone who can do it. Right, right. Well, I mean, I own a web design agency and I don't do it for my websites. I hire you to do it. <laughs> Because it's not. Yeah, guys, we have a vested interest here. <laughs> so, well, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it's I, I enjoy the weird stuff that people don't because of my IT background, and I love it because I used to set up email servers. Like we we used to host our website and our email in house in most oh, of geez. the companies I worked for, in between two thousand and like two thousand and maybe seven or six. Yeah. See, I don't, and I don't like any, I like the marketing, the messaging, the words, the conversion, the, you know, the data, um, the people, not that you don't like the people, that's what I'm yeah. saying, but I don't like the technical side of it. I use it as an enabler. I love the people and I think technology is there to help the people. And that's why we've been like in all what we talked about today, we're saying, Focus on the human, focus on your customer, yeah. not on Google. Don't neglect Google, but don't make it your main focus. That's what I'm saying. No, and it's the I, same I thing. So agree. what I do, there is technology. There's so much technology. Like I go to bed, I wake up, there's a new technology. And I love getting my hand on technology, playing around. Like in the past year, I have tested every single hosting option there is in hosting, everything. You know, the, the things with the strange names like the droplets or whatever. I've had DigitalOcean, I've had AWS hosting, Google Cloud hosting, Microsoft hosting, everything. And even, sorry, Vulture hosting, hosting from companies I've never heard about, hosting from companies that we all know, like SiteGround and, you know, oh, sorry, and HostGator and whatever. Only because I want to play with the technology. So I know which one will work for me, which one will work for my clients and which one will work for what I'm trying to do. And I spent hours and hours, but it also gives me the experience because when someone comes to me with a broken website, for me, it doesn't matter what their hosting is, I've tried them all. So I can get in and log in and I know it's a familiar, it, it's suddenly familiar waters for me <laughs> because I've been there before. That's cool. And I think the, the thing to keep in mind is I, I think, cause what I tried to always look for, and then I realized it was a myth. Um, and I think a lot of other people try to look for is you, people would just want to know, well, what do I have to do? Well, no, you, you're all this stuff, but you, you still haven't said, what do I have to do? And I think that comes down to the fact that because every website is different and unique, there's a recipe that's gone into that website. It, yes. it, it depends upon your hosting, the functionality of your website, the, the design of your website, all of these different things that depending on that unique mix of stuff, your optimization, now there's some principles, but the actual optimization is going to be different website to website to website. Yes. If you go back to the, web, uh, to, to the house analogy, this is your foundation and your framework, right? So yeah. everyone has, although we all use the, the same framework, which is WordPress, but we all have different themes and different plugins that write different code. And for the same thing that you're trying to do, there might be a plugin that doesn't better as well. I mean, every website has a contact form. Now, most of us nowadays, most of the people I know personally use Divi as their theme of choice. Now, when I use Divi, I don't use a plugin for a contact form. I use the contact form that comes with Divi. It has its pros and cons. Many people like to use gravity forms or something else. By all means, do it. That's fine. But when I go and inspect websites that need to be optimized, nine times out of 10, there's more than one plugin for a contact form. So there's an older plugin that they forgot about. It's still there. It's still loading its code. Yeah. Right? So you may have some redundant plugins there. So every website is different. Some things work for all. As an example, when you use a caching plugin, yeah, that's step number one. Put a caching plugin there. Let it cache your images and, and some of your uh, code. Let it minify your CSS. Um, one thing that I have to mention here, and it's very technical, but since so many technical people and many web designers are listening to us, if you see the word asynchronous load css asynchronously and you use divi do not load it asynchronously it will 
remove all your Divi animations. So don't do that. It's a good thing if you're not using Divi. <laughs> but for Divi, don't do the asynchronous one. Okay. Well, what about, but I mean, you know, because some people have in their Divi theme builder option for those that use Divi. And, you know, there are plenty of people that don't use Divi. But, you know, in the theme settings, mm -hmm. you can have checked on there to minify. Don't do you, that. No. Yeah. You see it. And that's the thing. I see that on a lot of sites. I'll get it. And they've checked it. But then they're using a caching plugin and then they've got a server set up and now it's just, now there's more of a mess. Yeah, exactly. Because you have three types of cache. They're all different. They don't talk to each other. And yeah. when it comes to the browser, when the user visits your website, the browser doesn't know which one to use. Right. So d don't do multiple caching as well. Like it doesn't serve any purpose. It doesn't make it faster. Well, it, and now because it's creating different files and, exactly. you know, and it just starts to really become. In the Divi settings, uncheck. The minify JavaScript and and uh, CSS, and then go to the next screen, the the builder options, the Divi builder options, and then if it says uh, create, I can't remember the wording now because I'm not looking at it. It says something about create unique CSS files or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, clear it if it's there. If it was checked already, you'll have a clear button. Clear that and uncheck them and then save. And then let your caching plugins do all the caching and the minification, not the theme itself. Uh, yeah, static CSS file. Exactly. Generator. Thank you. Generate static CSS files. You don't want that if you're using a caching plugin. If you have zero caching plugin, use that. But if you're going to use any caching plugin whatsoever, and for 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 the non-techies and the business owners who are listening to us now, thinking like, "What the hell is cache?" I'm not talking about money, by the way. It's a <laughs> it, They're not it, all thinking, well, I, want, I want more of that. I want more of that. Yeah, I want more cash. Um, it's a way f to speed up your browser. So every time you visit a website, some files get downloaded in a temporary folder on your phone or your computer that makes it way faster the second time you visit the same website. So this is the technical term for it is called cache. So what happens is that you get, you know, like uh, some of the images on a website that they, they are actually downloaded to your computer. They're in a temporary folder, even though you don't see this folder or maybe you don't know where it is, they're there. So when you go back to the same website, your browser is not going to look for the images again. It will use the images that are already on your machine. So this saves a few seconds, makes the website appear to be way faster. That's called a cache. So web designers, what we do is we use a plugin to create this cache. We create it on our server and then we give it to the user once the user comes to our website. Yeah, yeah. Cool, good stuff, man. I have learned a lot. There was a lot of things Thank in this you, I had never heard of before, so. Um, we yeah. need more cash. You've heard that before. We need more yeah, cash. Yeah, my <laughs> wife, I hear it every day. So, hey, Mr. Small Business Owner Man, we need more yeah. cash. So, uh, yeah, no, very cool. Well, thanks for sharing this with me and for everybody else. I think it's fantastic stuff. Um, it, it, it can definitely seem very technical and complex, but the key is find a partner you trust and find a partner that lets you know this isn't that hard. It's not that big of a deal. We can make, we're going to make this work. Yeah, and take a phased approach. Don't try to do it all at once. Yeah, that's true too. That's a really good approach. You know, and just start with a speed test. Yes, test it. Figure out how, how like, okay, I'm going to put the links, some of the links that I use, some of the tests that I use. I'm actually just, let, let me give you the easiest one, the quickest one. It's called Pingdom. Well, the company that owns it, owns it is Solar Winds. You're probably aware of it now since they got hacked. But <laughs> it's a big software company, and uh, it's called Pingdom. Uh, so the website is tools.pingdom.com. I'm gonna publish the link below uh, the episode. This episode. Cool. And of course, you're gonna find in Transit Studio link, Human Talents link, which is the name of my company, and anything that we discussed. In this episode, I'll just give you the link there and how to contact Eric as well.
Sounds great, sir. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Have a great day.